Hey, what's up guys? Long Island Audit here, back again with another video. Today I'm coming to you live, it's very special live, from Long Island, New York. We're going to be discussing illegally blind men arrested for obstruction as well as resisting. You know, you can't make this stuff up by a self-proclaimed tyrant. And I'm actually going to be discussing this with my good friends, Chief Scott and Detective Bannock. Let me bring them up here. See, everybody can see them. Hello, Chief Scott. Hello, Detective Vanek. Um, you know, before we get into it, I it, we should probably, you know, discuss any disclaimers you guys might have um, ahead of everything. And maybe just a little bit of background on you, Chief Scott, and uh, you too, um, Detective Vanek. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it, Sean. Great to be with you and uh, Sergeant Vanek. Um, and on behalf of Sergeant Vanek and I, just our disclaimer uh, to protect our rights, that anything you hear is not legal advice from us to you. Uh, you need to seek your own legal opinion on those things. So please don't construe anything we say as legal advice. And then we want to make sure that we are disassociated from any employers or anybody that we represent. Um, we are doing this independent of our own free will, and we're protecting our First Amendment rights um, to be able to have this conversation. We're really looking forward to it. So uh, just a real quick background, um, over 35 years in public safety, uh, retired as a police chief, and now I'm on the national circuit as a national law enforcement instructor and um, also an expert witness in court. So um, really love the opportunity to get out there and educate our men and women in uniform. And Sean, we know that you are a supporter of law enforcement. And the conversations that we've had, I've easily been able to glean that from you. So that no way have you ever shown to me that you're anti-law enforcement. In fact, you're trying to help us um, get better and do better and be better in how we serve the public. But more importantly, how we protect um, the precious document called our Constitution. And uh, really appreciate that and appreciate the conversation uh, that we're going to have tonight. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Detective Bannock. Mike well, I don't have. <laughs> hi, Sean. Good to see you. Um, hi, Chief Scott. I don't have the, quite the resume that Chief Scott does, but I've been it's in quite the resume. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, that's hard. That's hard to go after. But uh, I, I joined law enforcement back in 2006 um, and have been a detective for the uh, approaching five years now in January. Cool. So I'm just going to keep yeah. it simple as that. And yeah. And you also you also do. Um do the internal affairs investigations for your department, right? I, yes. Yeah. Okay. That and a lot of other things. Cool, yeah. Cause you, you hold people accountable. We're all, I'm all about accountability here. So that's, that's a good thing. So Us basically too. guys, you know, why chief Scott and I and detective Bannock, why we're all together here right now is to help bridge the gap between law enforcement and the public. You know, as you guys have seen in my videos and as chief Scott and detective Bannock have seen in my videos, you know, there's a lot of, you know, friction when it comes to exercising your rights and you know we're going to go into step by step on why this is happening and you know i have my theories and chief scott has his theories and detective bannock has their theories and you know i wanted to bring them on here because it gives you know the first 35 years law enforcement office law enforcement experience you know detective bannock with his many years you know it brings a different pers it brings like an actual perspective of law enforcement you know how why is this happening why does this continually happen like after all these videos, you know, we're going to try and meet up once a month so we can all talk together once a month, every month, like a reoccurring thing where we can look at videos that like we're about to watch and analyze them and see what they could have done better. You know what the auditor or the person, the citizen could have done differently, not just totally against law enforcement. But without further ado, you guys have anything else to say before we watch the video and get into it? No, let's roll. Nope, let's, roll. let's get into it then. Let's get into it. that it's not a firearm no you keep turning so i can't see it you don't have to be a dick to me 
Well, you're being one to me. No, sir, I'm Have doing my job. Day. Am I detained? Yeah, you are. What's your name and date of birth? It does not matter. Yes, sir, it does. Do you have a crime? Would you like me Call to your put supervisor, you in here? Please. He's right here. All right. Don't, you don't. Sir, what's the stock for? For a walking stick. So, I mean, it could look like a weapon. She asked you to really? present it, okay? Now she's asking me for to ID. Okay. I don't need the ID unless okay. there's reasonable, articulated suspicion and her that I have committed a crime and committing a crime and or about to do a crime. Sir, and her suspicion was that you were armed, okay, and she's asking you for your ID. Well, now okay. she has verified that I am not armed, okay, so there is no problem. You got problem. your ID or not? I do have my ID, okay. but you don't need it, okay? Okay. Yes, I am. Okay. I had to walk up here in the dark for jury duty, which was canceled. Why aren't you using your stick? You don't have to use your stick all the time? Not all the time. 26. Okay, Sergeant Bell, you're on the way. Sergeant Bell, you're on the way. All right, Mr. Hodges. Was that that hard? It's going to be. I want your name and your badge number. You know, I'll put him in jail for resisting. Okay. All right, let's go. I want your name and badge number two, sir. Have a seat. You want to pick my property up, please? I sure will, after you have a seat. You want to pull this out of my back pocket? Sure. Here, I'll grab your jacket for you, too. All right, guys. So we all just witnessed, you know, some craziness happen right there. Um, I'll give my thoughts on it first and then, uh, Chief, you can go. But, you know, right off the bat, you know, that escalated so quickly the, from the initial. That's what really strikes me, you know, the most is that it went from contact, making contact with this individual to him being placed in the back of a car in what less than you know, five minutes and having his freedom stolen from him. You know, I don't see how she thought that, you know, walking stick was a gun. I don't see how it resembles a gun even a little bit. It's halfway out of his back pocket. So I don't know if there's more to this story or anything. But before we actually, you know, it's just insane. And I want to get your guys thoughts on it. Really, everybody hears me talk all the time. So they, they know what I really think. I want to I'm curious to hear what you guys think. But really quick, I also wanted to bring up the sheriff's 
uh, statement here. So I know it's probably too small to see. I'll just read it. We are aware of the Columbia County Sheriff's Officer body camera video involving the arrest of Mr. James Hodges on October 31st, 2022. The Sher Sheriff Hunter is troubled by what he has seen in the video and the matter is being addressed. An administrative investigation was initiated on November 3rd when the incident was brought to our attention. If policy violations are sustained at the conclusion of that investigation, appropriate action will be taken. While we understand the frustration and concern associated with this event, please know we are working to resolve this matter as quickly as possible. So that is the statement from the sheriff here, Sheriff Mark Hunter. Chief, your thoughts? Wow, there's many. Um, you know, I, as we've talked in the past, um, I spend quite a bit of time viewing First Amendment audit videos. Um, again, part of it initially was just to educate myself because uh, I was working on a project for Second Amendment um, auditors, and it actually turned into First Amendment um, because I saw some videos and watched some of our brothers and sisters in law enforcement. And it's like, oh, my gosh, what are you guys doing? Um, there are agencies, and you've already shown this in a lot of your videos, Sean, that are doing it right. Uh, but unfortunately, we've got agencies that are doing it wrong. And we need to address that. And I know there's going to be some naysayers out there that are not going to be happy that we're having this conversation. I think you call them trolls um, that come through. And it's really unfortunate because they need to learn lessons from this and grow and be better. And when I'm out on the national circuit having conversations with departments, one of the things that I bring up initially, and this is what I saw in this video, is de-escalation actually starts with a proper introduction. You know, I've taught in the academy for years and had had the privilege to train men and women before they even hit the street. And one of the things that I emphasized heavily is the value of a proper introduction. I still, you know, I'm retired, but I work part time for a small department and you can pull my body cam any day of the week because I do the same thing every single time I make contact with somebody. Hey, I'm Officer Scott and I'm with XYZ Police Department. You are being audio and video recorded because I do have a body cam on just so they have awareness. And the reason I'm talking to you or the reason I'm stopping you is X. Immediately, as soon as you do that, you start to see the tension level decrease. And in this video, when I watch this, she is not giving a proper introduction. So again, a person, yeah, they're probably going to be a little ticked off. They're probably going to be a little standoffish. It's like, well, why are you contacting me? So again, when we think about de-escalation, it starts at that initial contact. But here's the thing, and it, what struck me is as soon as you put eyes on whatever was in his back pocket, and you know, obviously hindsight is 2020, right? And the Supreme Court recognizes that. It's easy for us to sit here and have this conversation and, and armchair quarterback any video. But at the same time, there's just some basic principles and rules in law enforcement that really get violated. And it, it does infringe upon people's rights, especially their constitutional rights. So as soon as you see that, that those are, you know, they could be nunchucks. I mean, there's probably an argument out there. Well, they could be nunchucks. OK, that's fine. Nunchucks are a weapon. But is it a gun? And even just looking at that, it's like, no. That's not obviously a gun. So let's de-escalate here a little bit. But unfortunately, this officer or both these officers were so fixated on the fact that they heard the word gun that they were sure that that's what it was. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to step in their shoes. I wasn't there. And I'm not trying to put words in their mouth. But at the same time, they should have shut it down. It's like, Hey, sir, I'm officer such and such with the sheriff's office. And the reason we're making contact with you is we got a citizen complaint um, of you walking down the road and it looked like you had a gun in, the, in your back pocket. But you know what? I don't see that you're carrying a weapon. Um, I really appreciate, you know, just your time standing here with me. We really have nothing else here to go on. You're not violating the law. Um, is there anything I can do for you? And if there's nothing, hey, have a great day and you're out of there. Um, but what did they do? They do like we always see demanding ID. I need to see your ID. Well, 
what did he do that was wrong? What did he do to violate the law? And once you've determined that there's no law violation, shut it down. But unfortunately, what happened is their egos took over. And even there towards the end, when before he was even going into cuffs, what did the sergeant say? Eh, lock him up for resisting. There's, those are always those go-to offenses that, that officers sometimes will go to as the, as the catch-all, if you will. So if you've violated my ego as a law enforcement officer, we're going to go and we're going to arrest you for disorderly conduct. Um, for sure. Heaven, heaven forbid you said a cuss word in public. Um, and I'll be honest with you, back in the day, <laughs> I made some of those attitude arrests. And now that I've matured, I hope, and gotten better in my career and educated myself and become educated, I look back at those and regret the way that I handled them and probably could have done it a lot differently. So really the goal here, Sean, is, is to educate the officers. And, and my hope is from our video and then what we're going to be doing in the future is that officers are going to start watching these things, start seeing the pattern of behavior that's going on and not get into that rut. And, and, and let's be honest, if you look at a lot of these cases that are going to civil trial, they're losing the cities, the counties, they're paying millions of dollars um, for actions of their officers that really this should have been handled through training. And, and it was, I guess it's just a pattern that we're seeing. And every once in a while, there's a video that comes along. They did it right. And by golly, we celebrate those moments. But it's moments like these that just make you cringe. And it's like, okay, what can we do to fix this? And what are we going to do moving forward? We can't fix the past, but we can fix moving forward in the future. For sure. And I, I agree with, you know, everything that you just said, you know, it, what really stuck out to me is that, you know, after he pulled, he didn't have to pull out his walking stick, right? He didn't have to. There was, you know, but he did. And he showed it to her. He said, you know, because, you know, reasonable suspicion, he said a reasonable articulable suspicion, which, you know, the way he was defending himself made me think that he watches, you know, First Amendment audits or is very well, definitely very well informed on his on his rights, mm -hmm. which I, I appreciate. Every citizen should be well informed on their rights and what um law enforcement officers can and cannot do because a lot of the times as you see in this video they don't even know so i definitely respect him a lot for that but you know once he shows the officer hey this is my walking stick at that point there's you know whether you thought it was an, a weapon nunchucks a gun but that's what they they said gun even if you thought it was a gun now you know it wasn't a gun and just let it go there's nothing there's nothing there but you want to give me your name and date of birth and then you know was he the most was he like really calm no because like you said she didn't do a proper introduction she wasn't she's give me your name and date of birth you know it's also the way some people wouldn't mind giving their name and date of birth i do i like to exercise my rights at all times whether i'm you know doing i'm you know at all times but some people might not you know the way you ask it hey you know i see that but would you mind if i get your name and date of birth you know, and then if they don't want to give it, oh, that's fine. No problem. You're under no legal obligation to. And, you know, the resisting charge, and I think he was also charged with obstruction. I believe the charges are dropped. Obviously, the charges are going to be dropped if they're not dropped already. Um, but as soon as he was just detained, right, until the moment he says, she says, was that so hard? Now, was that so hard? Again, so condescending, you know, and then he answers back, oh, it's going to be. Oh, let's get him for resisting. They didn't like his answer. And and that's and that's the problem is that he probably would have just been detained and let go until he said, oh, it's going to be hard for, for you because you just violated my rights. So instead of saying, you know what? We messed up. This guy is right. You know, a supervisor. Again, what qualifications does the supervisor have to, you know, how is he not? How does he not know these things? Like, I, it blows my mind that there's law enforcement officers, supervisors that don't no basic law and you know we've talked about it too scott on our previous conversations off camera it's you know i always said it's lack of accountability right because for example i've seen in the live chat here where these we have like three thousand two hundred 
3,200 people watching right now. And there's some people saying that they, the supervisor was suspended for seven days and the officer two days. Um, I, I, can't, I haven't verified that. But even if that is the case, you know, is that strong enough of a punishment to deter? Just because what is law and what is our criminal justice system, right? You break the law and then you're punished as not only to reform your behavior and so you don't do it again, but also to deter others from committing that same crime. So my thing is the accountability and the lack of accountability. And we could talk about Sergeant Fahey, uh, Mike, uh, but the lack of accountability, you know, in law enforcement is a big problem. But, you know, you opened my eyes when you told me, you know, I've always known it was ego. But you, when you told me the lack of education creates that ego, you know, it made a lot of sense to me because if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know the law, you don't know the full extent of your authority and – someone else comes along and tells you your extent of your authority like this gentleman did. Now you're like, wait, who are you to tell me my job? And look how she reacted. If she would have known that she can't identify him once her suspicion has been, you know, quelled and she has no more suspicion, then she wouldn't have came back at him. So hostile maybe. Right. right? So detective, right. Benny, you know, your thoughts on the situation and as somebody who handles internal <clears throat> affairs, you know, investigations, what in like what do you think something like this because we have to keep in mind right this man's freedom was taken from him it's it's more than just you know um they took his id without asking you taking somebody's freedom away i think that's something really serious you know you're taking somebody's freedom away my freedom's been taken me many times i could tell you it's not a nice thing to go through so you're taking somebody's freedom away you're, you know you're putting an arrest on the record how do you think you know what are your thoughts on the situation and um as far as like how do we not how does this stop and then i'll ask you how do we alex you two after this chief how do we how do we stop this from happening what needs to get done well, yeah, I think it's the proper training. You know, we lack the proper training. Every department is going through financial problems. So one of the line items that kind of gets nixed or reduced is training. Um, I think another issue is they're learning these bad habits from other officers, other supervisors or, or FTOs, uh, or it's a character issue. Now, the first two we can fix. The third one we can't. If it's a character issue, then they got to they got to go. They got to leave law enforcement, in my opinion. Um, Mr. Hodges is, is a great example of the type of juror that you want. He knows his rights, you know, he's going to go there and think for himself and I'm, he's lucky this didn't have a worse outcome because if they, she really believed that that was a firearm and he grabbed for it quick, you know, he that could have ended, you know, I, I noticed very badly. I was, yeah. I was, when I first saw that, I was a little worried too. I was like, oh man. Like yeah. what direction is this going to turn? Cause he was just like, is that, a, she's like, is that a gun? He's like, no, it's not, you know? Yeah. No. Yeah. That was abrupt. Yeah. 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 We're lucky. We didn't have a worse outcome than, than sure. what happened in my opinion. Gotcha. Yeah. So what do you think in the, in besides, you know, you know, we, so we talk about training a lot. I know chief Scott, you're a big proponent of training. You do training. I, I, when you told me that you, you know, use my video in Georgia, when you were training the, when you were talking to the police chiefs in Georgia, uh, my pooler video, um, yep. you know, it means a lot to me. You know, I hope, I hope I can try and like, I'm trying to bring awareness to like, how do we, you know, I get the training thing. We always talk about training, 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 but at the end of the day, there is a lot of training in law enforcement already. You know, is it, is it really the lack of funding for training or is it that the, the training is more of, cause I've spoken to my friend, Matt Thornton, he's an officer in Illinois and you know, he was told in his training, like dominate, like, is it, is it the lack of training or the training that isn't or, 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 you know, wrong, wrongful training, like training that shouldn't be taught, like exerting your dominance, making sure you control the situation at all times, seeing people as, you know, less than you like is that really being taught from your experience in academies because i've heard that it's being taught like to, to dominate to do those kinds of things well you know the, the interesting part of this is is a very critical balance between the need to take control of a hostile situation but then when to de-escalate and the hard part is, and I, and I think Sergeant Bannock will back me on this one because I know we've talked about it, that 
you know, you get called to a gun call. OK, we have to acknowledge that law enforcement is under attack by some people. Not everybody out there is trying to go up against law enforcement. So, one, we have to stop the mentality that everybody is a suspect that we come in contact with. Now, in context, if we're headed to a, a crime in progress, that's going to be a suspect, right? But if we're doing our job, we're approaching things the right way. We don't want to deminimize the need to go in and be careful in what we do, okay? There's a time and a place and a manner in which those opportunities, the officer needs to come in and take control of the situation. But as soon as you see something that doesn't meet how it was originally put out or the way the call is starting to roll out and things are very different or things are calming down or de-escalating, then we need to de-escalate. And sometimes what we're seeing is officers are so hyped up and pumped up that they're not thinking. Their, their brain has just literally shut off and they have forgotten the other part of de-escalation and driving that scene down, not ramping things back up. And as soon as a person asserts their rights, holy cow, I mean, a lot of these videos, it just amazes me, the number of officers who get ticked off at the fact a citizen knows their rights. It's almost like it's a crime and officers are treating it as a crime. And it's not the, op you know, there's nothing being like difficult, having, being difficult is what I get told like a lot. Yeah. Educated citizenry. But for some reason, that has come off as some crime or offense in law enforcement hand in the law enforcement handbook. And I have no knowledge of where that even exists to this day in writing. I'm still searching for it. It's the rainbows and unicorns uh, that we can't find. But at the end of the day, we've got to drive things down. We still have to, to appreciate the fact that, yes, there are people out there attacking law enforcement. Um, they're hitting us from blind sides. But that's not every call and that's not every citizen. So I think we have to really get back in tune. But here's the point I want to make when it comes to training. And this is what upsets me probably the most is we watch some of the First Amendment auditing videos that are out there. And Sean, you've had this happen to yourself. And you have to understand, I have watched hundreds of these videos. It's consumed a lot of my life but for the sake of training that's been worth it. But here's what we see. You've got officers trying to handle a call. You have a supervisor, whether it's a sergeant, lieutenant, captain, commander, whatever. They get on scene. Mo more often than not, the commanding officer or the supervisor gets on scene, sees what's going on, and what do they do? They immediately shut it down. They say, there's nothing here. Come on, guys, we need to leave. So what resonates in my mind is Sarge, Captain, Lieutenant, Chief, Sheriff, if you had that knowledge, why did you not pass that along to your people? Why are you not, and you know, we get that argument, there's no money in the budget for training. And I call BS on that. I'm very passionate about training. And I'm, I'm, I may get some people really upset at me over this, but so be it. If it changes your behavior and changes your agency, good. What are you doing in roll call? When you have roll call, whether it's two officers getting together or 200, if you're with them for any period of time, take your policy and procedure manual. Take this video. Okay, Sean, you showed a video tonight. What does it hurt to show that video in roll call, have conversation with a law enforcement group and say, what does our department policy say? Hoping they have one. What does it say and how should we actually handle this call? Sergeants, captains, chiefs, sheriffs, get in those roll calls, educate your officers and help them understand your policies and procedures and avoid, <clears throat> avoid this mess that's going on out there. Train your officers. And how much did that cost to do 15 minutes worth of roll call training? Zero dollars. It only costs your time. And I'm telling you, it's going to be worth it because do you want to pay out the multi-million dollars in a civil lawsuit? And then officers are getting their immunity taken away. And again, that's a whole nother conversation. 
that's out there, whether there should be qualified immunity or not. I know people are very passionate on both sides of the fence on that. But at the end of the day, that training costs absolutely nothing. And I want to praise Hubbard Police Department, uh, not just because Sergeant Bannock's sitting here in front of me and us, but their department should be praised because they were very proactive, Sean, in bringing you in. And and I praise Bannock, Sergeant Bannock and I praise the chief for being open-minded and looking for a new way and a different way. Look what they did to those, look what they did to that department. So I'm gonna be quiet. Obviously you can see my passion for education and training and there's no excuse. There's absolutely no excuse. There is available training out there at minimal or no cost. And it's right there in their department. And hopefully they have the education and knowledge to back that all up. Uh, that's the other side that we have to work on. So, but there are enough agencies out there that know exactly what we're talking about tonight and know exactly how to mitigate this, but it's not getting passed down to the road patrol officers. They're not running scenarios. They're not spending time with their officers to prevent these things from occurring. So I'm going to be quiet and let Sergeant Bannock have the floor here for a minute. Yeah. So uh, uh, Sergeant Bannock, you know, he brought up our training that we did, you know, it, I received some pushback too, because at the end of the day, you know, even just having the same way you reach out, reach you reaching out to me, detective Bannock and setting up the training or chief Scott, you reaching out to me and we, us communicating and, you know, doing this, there's always going to be people on both sides of the spectrum that are going to say, Oh, you're working with the police. They're the enemy. And then, you know, there's going, I'm sure there's going to be law enforcement officers that watch us that say, why are you talking to this? You know, at police agitator who just wants to make us look bad and you know there's always going to be those kinds of people i try and ignore both of those sides of people and focus on the people that you can actually like have a reasonable conversation with so that's why when you invited me for the training i was so eager to do it and help you and we worked together on that training and you did a great job and you know the chief and everybody that was participating we had great conversation it, it, it was it was wonderful really it was and it, it, I wanted to do it because I wanted to show that. And I also did the ride along with you guys. I wanted to show you, I'll link those in the description below because anybody hasn't seen them because those videos don't seem to be as popular, but it's important. Really. It's important for everyone to see them because, you know, I'm looking at the comment section here and there's a lot of people that are, you know, I like to get the feel for, you know, what people, what the people are saying, at least the people that are watching, you know, my channel. And, and I like to think the people watching my channel mostly are reasonable people and you know they're tired of it right they're tired of all these things keep happening and there's no consequences for law enforcement and you know it seems to me you know i'm very the same way i say i support them the same way i say that in my opinion that without a doubt both of those officers should be fired because they're not going there's no suspension that's going to take care of you're taking away somebody's freedom or arrest them and then do the same thing you know there's nothing that's going to take away that in my, again in my opinion there's nothing because it frustrates me that you know i've been arrested so many times and then oh 20 years ago he would have been dead with his teeth missing um grabbing me up thinking my phone's a taser and i've seen time after time and people and you know the, the people we the people we've seen time after time unless you brutally murder unless you murder someone in front of the world on camera you know unless it becomes something so crazy, there's not any accountability, you know? And if maybe there was accountability beforehand, these egregious, you know, incidents wouldn't happen because it's usually, uh, you know, it doesn't, Detective Bennett, you know, I'm sure you can agree in chief, you, you too. It doesn't usually just start at something so egregious, right? There's like warning signs that happen and, you know, complaints that are filed against officers that get pushed under the rug and say, hey, you know, it's not a big deal. I filed so many complaints. Some of them I haven't heard back. They haven't even called. There's an internal affairs department for a reason that's supposed to handle these things. And you won't believe how many times internal affairs has just ignored my complaint. And I am, you know, there's over 3,000 people watching us right now. Over hundreds of thousands of people will watch this video in totality, I hope. And if they're ignoring my complaints, what do you think they're doing to, you know, john smith down the street and if they're arresting me what are they doing to people that you know don't have the resources don't have you know it, it really worries me and 
the fact that you that you took an oath to uphold the constitution and you're supposed to be protecting and serving the people but and like i said i'm not saying that i if i thought all cops were tyrants i wouldn't be talking to you guys right now right but i i truly believe that there has to be some sort of solution and i really think this i know chief you're very uh you're very pro pro education so that we can get rid of that ego i'm really pro discipline pro consequences pro accountability for those actions because if you think about it you know we should hold officers to a higher standard than most professions because you're i i couldn't think of a profession really that you should hide to a higher standard because even like like a door greeter at walmart or somebody you know who has a nine to five regular job if they told a customer right 20 years ago you'd have been dead with your teeth missing after an altercation they would be fired simple it's there's no there's no suspension there's no nothing they're going to be fired um and like like you said we could talk about qualified immunity another day i don't want to make this video too long but and we could talk about you know police unions and because you know if you guys want to talk to me i'm going to talk to you about all those things so (laughs) you might not want to come back next month but the the (laughs) thing is to me is that it needs to be held to a higher standard so what do you think i know you had told me detective bannock um if you want to talk about that what, what we did in training you know about when when these things happen they're useless to your department right because they become yeah. useless because they can't testify can you go into a little bit about how you how you feel about you know disciplining as as somebody who runs internal affairs at your department sure so my job is to investigate i don't uh dole out the discipline that's for the chief and for him to decide what the appropriate discipline is and you know as you met chief thompson he's reasonable and and all for accountability right and like you had mentioned with um you know people that do things i can guarantee you that the people that work with that person aren't surprised by what that person has done they they saw that coming right so these things need to be handled early and quickly as possible before it gets to something severe like that yeah um what was your question oh no just just that what do you think that <clears throat> what do you, what do you think i know that you had said in the training uh, that i thought was very in uh important i just want to talk to, i just want to say something funny thank you for the donation of uh 99 keep up the great work sean great job officers and everybody that's uh been donating um we i actually talked to the chief he's doing this you know just out of the love of trying to better law enforcement and so is my friend detective bannock and you know we decided that we're going to all the revenue that this video makes. So next time, next month, when we meet again, hopefully they, if they were so gracious with that, to, you know, give me their time. When we talk next month, we'll each pick a different um, charity to give, you know, the, the revenue from this video, because I think it's very important, you know, for, for a good cause, you know, just something that we can all do pro bono and, and help out somebody in need. So I appreciate all the super chats, you know, it really helps a lot. But again, you had said to get back really quick, um about when you lie you know once an officer lies you had said that you know how would we ever just like can you go into that a little bit how, yeah how, how well, we were we were analyzing the ia report from sergeant fahey's incident right and <laughs> uh, have you read it chief scott did you get a chance to yeah, read that I, yes i yeah. have i um, great creative I writing right Ugh. yeah so i mean once you lie like that you're you're useless to law enforcement you can't testify. Yeah. You, you become true. what they call a Giglio Brady officer and you can't testify yeah. anymore. And as far as our training goes, um, I don't know if you know, Sean, but that that only costs our department like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars total to have everybody come. You know, we're a smaller department, about 13, 14 people. That that's minimal money compared to what you know you could potentially pay out in a lawsuit. And I think that was probably one of the, you know better ideas that I've ever had to, to invite you to come down and thanks to chief Thompson and, and the safety director, uh, Bill Bancroft for, you know, letting that happen. Uh, I would totally do it again. You know, we learned a lot from each other, Sean, I think, and, and, uh, everyone enjoyed that experience. You know, a lot of these, you know, I could have just handled through email. Hey, don't act like these people are on YouTube. Right. But I wanted to make more of an impact. It was moved because, um, daily YouTube channels are filling up with cops saying and doing not so good things. Right. And I want to do whatever I can to help law enforcement improve. And, and I think that was the start of it there. 
hopefully our, our collaboration will, will further that. I hope so. You know, I, I've been invited to, to, to do ride alongs in other departments and I'm, that I'm, you know, looking into. So it did open some, some doors and, you know, I appreciate it. And, you know, I just want to make it clear for full transparency. None of that $1,200 had anything to do with me. I 100%, as you know, Detective Bannock did that, you know, just to help bridge the gap. So, but uh, of course, officers and to getting there to training costs money. I understand that. Mm -hmm. So I would want to read this last comment here because Skazlo photo, police, police need to be taught that an arrest is a violent act equivalent to multiple violent felonies, similar to a citizen dragging someone into their car and forcing them into a cage in their basement. An unethical, an ethical officer should hate arresting people. I think I think he's making a good point with his comment. I really do because you know just because you have a gun and a badge on and you we we the, we the people have given you and entr entrusted you with some uh, authority doesn't mean that you should get away with. I mean he's essentially right. You're kidnappings. They, that man was he had things to do. He might have had a dinner to go to. He had you know to meet up with his children, pick his you know see his grandkids that day, and he had to spend the night or a few hours whatever in a cell. You know, fingerprinted all because of an ego. You know, I don't really. <laughs> I heard it was twenty six hours he spent in jail. Twenty six. That's what you heard. That's what I heard. Yeah. Twenty six. That's a long. That's a long time. You know, again, the consequences. I I hear I see all the chats and I agree. Like you know, consequences have to be serious for these kinds of things, because if 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 they if those officers were fired on the spot. I guarantee you that nobody in that department would ever make that mistake again because those officers just lost their livelihood. You know, I get it. But anyways, guys, I didn't want to make this video too long. I think we had a great discussion. Um, plus, we're going to do it again. Hopefully, Chief, Detective, Bannock. Absolutely. Yep. Really right. looking forward to it. This is all hey, part do of you my... guys have any final thoughts or anything else to say? I, the only final thought I've got are two things. Law enforcement needs to take two classes. And I make no money by making this statement. Uh, the poster that's behind me right there um, is from the Wright Academy, um, R-I-T-E. So it's Racial Intelligence Training and Engagement. Uh, if they've never taken that course, I highly recommend they take it. And the other one is the ABLE program, the Active Bystander for Law Enforcement uh, through uh, Georgetown Law. That's actually free. Departments can send officers to be instructed, um, to become instructors, and then bring that training back to their agencies. That is one of the first steps between these two programs of de-escalating and learning how to just approach these incidents a little bit different, safe, right? We want the officers safe because the goal is we want the officers to go home at the end of the day, but we also want our citizens to be treated fairly with respect. And if they violated the law, then we got to do what we got to do, right? Mm -hmm. But we can do it respectfully. We don't have to toss people around and allow our egos to drive um, bad conduct, right? I always made the statement, when the cuffs are on, the fight is over. Now I get that there's suspects that are going to sit there and they're going to kick and punch and scream and spit. OK, but that's very few. That is not that many in the course of looking at those that you put in cuffs. But again, some people are resisting because you're you're still applying force. So back off and the, and the person may act a little bit differently. So, again, there's a lot of different approaches. A lot of this behavior comes back to how they're trained. It's the department's culture and what they accept, but also how are they being trained? And are we making sure that training is up to date, it's current, and it's legitimate, and it's also lawful? So those are my final comments. I'm really looking forward to what we may be able to do in the future because, again, Sean, this is how we, we bridge that divide, right? It's law enforcement being willing to accept if we've done anything wrong, let's fess up and let's fix it. And this is how we make those steps. And sometimes it's painful. Sometimes that means we have to admit our wrongs, but you know what? I'd rather take a person and I will respect them more for stepping up when they're wrong than to sit there and just try to cover things over. So 
Um, I think we're on the right path. I just hope that we can bridge the gap here. And I think we've made a great stride to do that. And I really appreciate you, appreciate Sergeant Bannock to take the time tonight and looking forward to the future. Sergeant Bannock, I really appreciate you coming. You know, you're a good guy. And I know you're a good guy. Chief Scott, can't wait to meet you guys in person. Um, hopefully, I'll see you guys in Danbury. And I'll see all of you in Danbury as well, because that's going to be recorded. So, you know, we'll see what that what we have to do there. Maybe we can get a Chief Scott to be an expert witness or something. I don't know. <laughs> you said you were an expert witness. But, you know, it was great talking to you guys. And I, and I really do hope that this can – if this can change one department, right? Just one department's culture, like you said, one department from, you know, that that can use this as some sort of training and some sort of, you know, let's let's talk about these things. Let's get these things out in the open, you know. I you know, it would make me really happy. But till next time, guys. Thank you guys again. Appreciate you. All right, Thanks, guys. Sean. So we're going to be getting out of here. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.